Well, thanks everybody for being here. Okay. Um, I, we have, I haven't met some of you, but I'm Joanne Brown. I'm the new chair of Community Board 14. Carl. Nice to meet all of you. Um, the meeting. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce the first session of the Community Board 14 Lunch and Learn series. Welcome. Thanks for coming here. Thank you to our presenters, uh, our presenter and um, our, our other host. Um, once again, District Manager Sean Campbell has created an innovative set of programming that aims to demystify topics that are often part of the business of the board and the community to weigh in on. I've got questions about ULERP, special permits, zoning studies? We probably do too. Starting today and continuing every Thursday until June 10th, we've got expert heavyweights lined up to share our lunches with and improve our knowledge base. Today's Lunch and Learn will be hosted by Community Board 14 member Gregory Alvarez, who is our resident expert in city planning. So without further ado, please welcome Gregory Alvarez, who will introduce our first guest presenter. Uh, thank you, Joanne. <laughs> Uh, resident expert, well, you're too kind, but um, so we're, we're here today to talk about zoning and uh, we're very excited today because we have a, um, you know, we do have a, a very good expert from the Department of City Planning. His name is Jonah Rogoff, a city planner there who has prepared a, a very comprehensive uh, review uh, just to give us all a, a good foundation in the zoning uh, process and how the zoning resolution uh, works uh, in tandem with that uh, for land use applications that become that become that come before the board. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Jonah and uh, I'll just be here to monitor the chat and hope to facilitate some uh, Q&A afterwards once Jonah is completed. So Jonah, please uh, 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 begin begin away and, uh, and when we're all anxious to hear uh, what you have to offer today. Great, thanks, Greg. I just want to start by thanking the board for the opportunity to present today. Um, and I, I want to say too that uh, while I'll be presenting, uh, you know, I see this as a two-way conversation. So, uh, you know, just as much as we want to share information, we also want to hear from you uh, about some of the issues and concerns you have related to zoning. Um, so, my goal is to present about uh, thirty minutes, but leave ample time for question and answers and um, and you know uh, I also see Richard Barrick here who is uh, much more knowledgeable than me and I'm sure we'll can can fill in um, so I'll just start off by sharing my presentation uh, oh I'm not sure if I fully introduced myself too I'm a planner in the Brooklyn office city planning so uh, and I cover uh, CD 14 so we each have liaison roles but we we have projects that are kind of spread throughout the borough, if that makes sense. There we go. There you go. Thanks, Anya. You can start on the second page. And feel free to uh, make it full screen if that's helpful. Uh, so, as I was saying, four goals for today. Uh, first, talking just basic info about you know, what zoning and its origins are in the city. Uh, second, uh, I want to be able to to teach you how to navigate zoning and um, interpret it in key ways. Uh, third, uh, I wanted to get more in the weeds of. <laughs> Um, how zoning is updated. Uh, many of you are familiar with that process, um, but I wanted to touch more on what specific land use rationales we use and specifically the commission um, and how that relates to recent proposals within community board 14. Um, and then finally, uh, we have a, lot, a few tools and resources available for zoning in addition to, to uh, us ourselves. Um, so I wanted to just maybe do a, a uh, quick demo of some of those. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Anya. So, first, really quickly, many of you are familiar with zoning, uh, so I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, but at a very core level, zoning regulates uh, what, how much, and where buildings and uses are located, so that 
in practical terms, that means uh, everything from the types of land uses, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, to um, the size and shape of buildings, whether that's the, the density of a building, the height, the rear the yards, the setback. Um, so it kind of encapsulates a variety of issues and a variety of regulations. Um, and it, it serves multiple purposes, but it, 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 it's partly to provide a framework for what is appropriate for what growth can occur over time. Um, and it also provides certainty for property owners, for developers. Uh, so we try to have a, a basic level of consistency and appropriateness uh, when we apply zoning throughout the city. Uh, you can go to the next slide. On um, so many people are, are kind of surprised to hear, but uh, when we, the, the core legal foundation for zoning is a, a kind of a, a part of the, the city's police powers. Um, and at the front of every section, uh, it's we state very clearly the purpose is for the public health, safety, and welfare of all users of the city. Um, and I just put that there just to as a reminder that uh, zoning and land use uh, really is designed to serve a variety of of functions, uh, you know, from quality of life to just overall the health and wellness of a community. Next slide. And uh, just really briefly on history, uh, the origin of zoning stems from uh, the overcrowded conditions of the 19, of uh, the, uh, I would say mid early, or just overall the 1800s when the, the city was experiencing rapid population growth, uh, and there was very little uh, regulation to control uh, density and the mix of uses. Um, so these are just a few photos of uh, the, the Lower East Side and East Village, which are emblematic of the the, the tenements that were constructed at the time. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, and then, uh, as a good example of this. Uh, we like to show the um, the uh, uh, the building that we currently are occupied of in on Wall Street, uh, which was constructed without any setbacks. That was one of the catalysts for the original 1916 zoning, um, as well as the Garment District in Manhattan, which at the time flourished as a, a manufacturing hub. Uh, but caused a lot of conflicts with uh, people that worked and lived nearby. Um, so that was uh, really uh, a catalyst for views of how do we um, separate uses, uh, which is a key foundation for for zoning. Uh, next slide. Thanks. And um, I just showed the evolution evolution of some of the pre zoning rules, uh, the tenement laws which governed residential were a uh, foundation for, for much of the modern zoning that we have. Uh, so before the uh, 1879, uh, windows were not required in all um, habitable rooms. Um, and then uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then in 1879, that was the, the city's old law tenement rules, which required a uh, certain amount of light shafts and windows, and that, that kind of set a precedent for the need for uh, light and air, uh, which at the time was associated with uh, public health. Um, and, and in a way, it kind of rem it, it harkens to the, uh, the period that we're in right now when we're thinking more holistically about that with the current pandemic. Um, and then uh, those, the old law tenements were updated in 1901. Uh, known as the new law tenement that essentially just required stronger levels of enforcement and larger inner courts uh, to strengthen the the amount of light and air that could be uh, could uh, enter all apartments and uh, that kind of leads to the 1916 uh, comprehensive zoning resolution which was our first 
uh, zoning uh, law that we enacted in the city. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and that uh, really captured the uh, the spirit of the tenement laws and applied it uh, citywide to all types of buildings and uses. Um, and in in that in that period, the the well, first the zoning resolution is only fifty pages, which is uh, much uh, shorter than what it is today. Um, and the height of buildings were really governed by uh, certain locations. So you know, Midtown or um, parts of the outer boroughs were had different levels of densities, but it was primarily controlled by the width of the street. Um, so buildings could rise to a certain height after which they would be required to, to set back um, by uh, kind of the sky exposure plane. And that's why you see many buildings um, in the period of the uh, pre-war after post-1916 that have kind of the pyramid-like or step, step ups, um, which were um, directly tied to the zoning resolution. Next slide. So as the city continued to grow and we uh, were faced with suburbanization, the rapid growth of uh, vehicles as a primary mode of transport, um, zoning had to evolve. And during the 1950s, there was an effort to uh, create a, a consistent system that better responded to those issues. Um, and and uh, really create a need for uh, a single type of zoning district rather than kind of a dispersed set of regulations based on use or height. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and just as an example of one of the key tools that were that was created at that period was uh, floor area ratio or FAR. And I'm sure many of you are familiar, but uh, just to provide some background, uh, FAR governs the amount of floor space that can be constructed on any part of the city. And, and that's really a key tool for uh, controlling the amount of uh, building area. Uh, and as an example, uh, floor area ratio is just the ratio between um, the amount of building space that you can uh, construct on a lot and the size of a lot. So if you have a building that is, or a, a lot that is two FAR, that means you can build sort of twice the amount of space on that lot. Um, and depending on the height regulations, the yard or setbacks, you could distribute that floor area in different ways. Uh, so uh, uh, the second uh, lot is an example of maybe like a manufacturing facility where you could um, really construct, you know, more full, full like a full lot coverage. Um, whereas other parts of the city, if you have certain yard regulations, you could uh, can you have to set back the building, and so that could result in maybe like a four-story building. Or if you have more flexibility, like a um, where there are no height regulations or height regulations are just required to set back from the street, that could result in an eight-story building. So it's just to show you how the the density really could stay the same, uh, but it varies based on the uh, height and setback rules. And go to the next slide. So since 1961, we've made a number of updates, which I'll, I'll just quickly run through, starting with uh, contextual zoning. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I just pulled a couple of examples in Flatbush and Dimas Park, because um, I think they do a great job of illustrating this. Um, so these are both areas that were rezoned as part of the 2009 Flatbush rezoning. Um, so as an example, uh, many parts of uh, Ocean Avenue were mapped as 
R78. Uh, and that was primarily to us to protect the, the character of that street while providing some modest level of uh, growth and density. And as you can see, R seven A has a uh, a certain height limit, but it also uh, ensures some level of uh, context that a building can't be further, can't be closer to the street line than generally the adjacent building. So on the left, you can see the building uh, you know had to essentially almost line up with the the neighboring building, and then it was also limited to a certain height. Uh, generally a base height of uh, 70, 75 feet, and then a building height of 85 feet. And then on the right is an example of contextual zoning with similar uh, lineup provisions, but in a lower density context for uh, parts of a Ditmas Park, uh, where you have the single or two family detached homes. Um, and so there it's, it's more of a mechanism to, to really just preserve that that character and that consistency of the, the street wall and yards that you see that really defines the uh, Victorian Flatbush community. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Jonah, Jonah. just one, one question uh, yeah. from Carl about FAR. Carl, if you'd like to ask that question. Uh, yes, so uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Jonah. Um, I believe Anya, you may be presenting. Anya, could you go back? I think one or two slides to the uh, yes, that one. And so I'm reading the description about like the 10,000 square foot lot, and if it had a maximum FAR of two, the floor area cannot exceed 20,000 feet. And so that makes sense to me mathematically. But the part that I'm struggling is if the lot is 10,000 and the max FAR is 20,000 then how could you add more, right? Like I'm wondering, would there need to be some sort of permit to say you have the right to get an additional 10,000? Is it, because just looking at the example, it looks like you're building up, right? But even if you're building up, if you're only occupying X percent, that's that. And so it makes sense to me up until the FAR exceeds one, and then I'm wondering how that works out. So that's my question. Got it, it's a good question. So maybe I could have, Clarify this a little bit more. Um, the each zoning district has its own FAR, and so uh, you have to, uh, if you're building anything, um, you have to abide by that and meet the requirements of zoning, and that that's quite restrictive. Um, if you want to build more, then you would have to apply for a rezoning, or you could, uh, I'll. Touch on this later in the presentation, um, but you could apply to the the BSA as well. Um, does that answer your question? Um, I think it does for a little bit. I know there's more stuff, and like you said, you may get into it deeper in the presentation, and so I'll probably see what comes forth later on. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just really quickly, uh, th this isn't much of an issue for community district 14, uh, but it's, it's a really common issue in other neighborhoods where uh, there is a desire to uh, reimagine or think about how to better utilize industrial areas, uh, given the pressure for, uh, for housing uh, and, and also affordable housing. And so uh, in parts of Williamsburg and Hunters Point on Island City are areas where we uh, applied a mixed use district which essentially allow uh, industrial uses to be co-located or coexist with manufacturing or industrial, uh, or sorry, residential with uh, industrial uses. Um, and so this is just a, an example of how uh, zoning, uh, you know, originally was meant to separate uses, so, you know, thinking of the garment district, um, but now it's sort of, we're thinking uh, about flexibility as well, just giving the, the evolving needs for the city. Uh, can go to the next slide. Oh, I think we covered this. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, another 
key issue after the 1961 resume, uh, resolution was adopted was the need for open space and how to encourage that. And, um, and so, as an example, in Williamsburg, uh, along the waterfront and other privately owned waterfronts, we have requirements that whenever you're developing uh, commercial or residential, we require a certain amount of uh, waterfront public access area. And then in higher density parts of the city, like lower Manhattan, we uh, have zoning uh, floor area bonuses to provide uh, public plazas or privately owned public spaces. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, another major issue was how to um, how zoning can accommodate uh, retrofits to protect against flooding. Uh, so uh, we just recently enacted regulations to uh, provide some flexibility for, so buildings can better elevate, but while also uh, fitting within the context of your community. And again, this is uh, an issue for CD14, but just represents a, an important effort that the department has been working on. Uh, and then, uh, as many of you know, affordable housing is a is a critical issue in our city. And uh, in 2016, we enacted a uh, a citywide tool called Mandatory Inclusionary Housing, or MIH. And that, that's essentially building on a voluntary program that we've applied in, um, and it's a it's a partly a policy that whenever we are uh, undertaking a rezoning that increases the capacity for residential, uh, we apply an, an MIH area, so that ensures that if there is housing developed there, uh, a developer would be required. Uh, to provide a certain amount of affordable housing um, pursuant to a few options. Uh, the first couple options are for 25% of the housing to be affordable at 60% of the area median income or AMI. Um, and the second option is for 30% of the housing to be at 80% AMI. Uh, and so the way the MIH program is designed is to kind of be a trade off between um, the, the amount of affordable housing and the level of affordability. Um, and we also have two other options that are, are used less, uh, but just to point out, uh, one is a, what we call the deep affordability option where uh, it's 20% uh, of the housing uh, would be affordable at a lower MMI of 40%. And then for more moderate income communities that want to see uh, more moderate income affordable units, uh, we have what's called a workforce option where 30% uh, of the housing would be affordable at a higher AMI of 115%. Uh, and then you can, go, uh, you can go to the next slide. Jonah, just yep. while it's switching, um, yep. so the MIH is actually mapped into the zoning map, correct? Like areas where it, it can't just go anywhere; it has to go where it's mapped on the zoning map. Is that correct? It's not technically part of the zoning map, but it's it's its own map within the zoning resolution. If that makes okay. sense. It does. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, just you know, how do you read zoning? Um, so th maybe this is I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but you know, I think what's helpful to know is a uh, Many people know that the, you know the first letter in zoning, the R, the C, the M, just indicates the the zoning district. So whether that's residential, commercial, manufacturing, the second number indicates the intensity of the use. So when you think of the commercial overlays; those are C1, C2 districts, much less intense compared to uh, a C8 district, like along Coney Island Avenue that has. Um, more um, like gas stations or garages. Um, and then the number after the dash just indicates the, the level of parking requirements. And so generally it's 
so it's the reverse order where the lower the number, uh, the higher the, the parking requirement. Um, and then contextual districts always have a, a letter suffix next to them, or, or almost always they do. And so that just indicates that there's, uh, there are certain height and um, uh, base height restrictions compared to uh, what we classify as height factor districts, which are governed by um, the uh, the kind of the amount of open space or um, a sky exposure plane that requires buildings to set back a certain distance from the street. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And uh, to give a snapshot of the, the types of residential districts, uh, I tried to customize this for for um, uh, the community. Uh, so starting with uh, the uh, CB14 is a great example where you have the full, almost like the full gamut of low and mid mid density districts. So uh, parts of the Prospect Hall, uh, Park South area that's uh, within the historic district that's zoned R1. Um, parts of Midwood are zoned R2. Those are only single family detached districts. And then uh, R3 and R4 generally allow uh, one and two family districts, uh, but they're still lower density like R5. Um, and I can get into the weeds of the, the differences, but they're essentially um, a lot, um, kind of stepping up in density, um, starting with uh, 0.5 FAR for R1, um, and then R10 is all the way up to uh, 12 FAR. Um, and uh, R9 and R10 are considered a high density. Um, you typically consider R6 to R8 as a moderate density. Um, and then R5 and below are just low density. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, and then commercial districts. Uh, I touched on this, but you know, uh, commercial overlays are C1, C2 districts. Those are the local retail corridors. Uh, and then uh, C3 is just uh, kind of a C, C oriented district. Um, I wouldn't pay attention to that. It's mapped in very few places. Um, C4 districts are like the Flappish Junction. They're regional uh, commercial hubs that allow multiple floors of uh, retail, and then um, C5 and C6 districts are more of the uh, central business districts of Lower Manhattan, Long Island City, uh, Midtown, and Downtown Brooklyn. Uh, and then C7, C8 are more um, specialized districts that are higher intensity. C7 is just uh, like the amusement park style district, like Coney Island Ave, or Coney Island, excuse me. And then Coney Island Ave uh, is an example of the C8 district, which is almost this uh, in between between a it's almost like a semi industrial area that allows more intensive types of commercial. Uh, can go to the next slide. Thanks. And uh, manufacturing districts are um, similar. So we have MX districts uh, and then M1, M2 and M3 ranging in intensity. Uh, and, and they all typically allow um, different types of industrial. Uh, M1 districts have a higher, uh, many more regulations that control uh, noise and odors and other things that we call um, performance standards. Uh, and M1 are, are usually areas that are buffers between residential areas. And so they have restrictions on um, how industrial can be built and typically it has to be covered if it's a certain distance from where people are living. Uh, and then M2 and M3 are more of the um, typical um, uh, intensive heavy industrial areas with M3 being kind of the city's like critical infrastructure like uh, sewage treatment plant or sewage treatment plants or heavy manufacturing. Go to the next slide. And uh, use groups are are uh, in order of intensity for, so, and are grouped by compatibility. Uh, so use groups one and two are for residential 
community facilities like doctor's offices or hospitals are more compatible with housing. So those are grouped in the next categories of three and four. And then use groups five through 15 are commercial. Uh, and then it increases to 16 to 18 with 18 being the, the heavy manufacturing uses that are uh, only allowed in M3 districts or are allowed in other types of manufacturing districts, but under higher uh, regulations. And, oh, I think we need to. Wrap up, Jonah. Give one. Great. Uh, so, where do you find the zoning? Um, before a few years ago, we we had these 3,000 page multiple binders that we had to navigate and uh, you know, our eyes were, were getting progressively worse as of it. Um, more recently, we've uh, annotated the full um, the zoning resolution. So you can actually just scroll and open uh, each uh, section. Uh, and then there are links to to go back to different sections. So it makes it much more easy to navigate. Um, I would say most of the zoning resolution is within um, the first eight articles. Um, the rest are either zoning maps or special districts, which are customized rules for different parts of the city. Jonah, um, do we do we have any special districts in our district? I don't believe we do, but no. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, you can go to the next slide. And if you're looking at a zoning map, uh, how do you read it? Uh, just really briefly, the zoning district is always indicated in the, uh, like you can see R3X, um, that's self explanatory. Commercial overlays are always hacked, uh, shown in a hatched or shading. Um, and then special districts always have a, a gray shading above them. Um, so if you're, if you happen to be looking at the actual zoning map, um, that's how you'd read them. And then finally, um, the most recent zoning change is always, um, outlined in a dashed line. So how, how can zoning. Be, be changed and 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 why why is it changed? Um, there are many different reasons for that. I think um, you know first and foremost, uh, we're thinking about what are the planning goals and visions of a neighborhood. Uh, we're balancing what uh, what is the existing context and character versus what type of development is appropriate in the future. Um, and but when I say we, I mean um, partly the planning commission, but also uh, collective we, the community board, borough president, uh, the, and eventually the city council, which votes on. Um, I also just want to say that um, anyone can propose a zoning change, so it could either be a, a private applicant, meaning a developer or an owner, or it can also be the city itself. So in the case of uh, the Flatbush rezoning or the Midwood rezoning, um, that was the department that undertook those those changes. Um, and uh, and they can be for a variety of purposes. They can be for uh, promoting development or facilitating development, at, or uh, they could also be for uh, bringing uses into greater conformance when, uh, let's say, you have a uh, an industrial use that's within a residential area. Um, sometimes we want to, or a residential use in an industrial area. Sometimes we want to bring those uses into conformance, um, or buildings that are built above what's permitted. Um, so we we like to say we bring those uh, buildings into greater compliance. Um, and then I also just want to say too that all rezoning changes have their own 
uh, environmental review, and they require a full uh, public review process known as ULERP, uh, which is just a basic requirement. And just as an example, uh, Williamsburg is, a, is is one where it's a transformational change where we're looking at an entire waterfront and we're thinking about how do we re-envision a community based on goals of uh, accommodating population growth and housing or city looking uh, almost as a creating a, a neighborhood. Uh, and then you can go to the next slide. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have rezonings like uh, the Flatbush rezoning or the bed rezoning, where it's a it's kind of a combination of those goals where we're thinking about corridors or areas that can accommodate growth. But the primary goal of those rezonings is to support and preserve the neighborhood character. And so bed is a good example where, uh, you know, while we did uh, upzone parts of Fulton Street or DeKalb Avenue, um, for the most part, we contextualize the, the mid blocks and preserve that brownstone uh, character. Uh, so uh, I just want to kind of jump to TB14 because I think it's a fascinating, really great example of us. Uh, we, so on, on one hand, we have uh, lower density districts like R3X, uh, which were as I mentioned earlier, were designed to preserve the uh, Victorian homes that represents the the history of the neighborhood, um, and those are usually oriented on, on uh, mid blocks uh, um, as opposed to uh, corridors. And I can go into the the details, but as I mentioned, it's uh, there are really strict rules about heights and how buildings can can kind of line up, uh, as well as parking and yard regulations. Um, and then going as an example of a moderate density district, we uh, mapped R78 along uh, key corridors like Ocean Avenue, Flatbush, uh, parts of Coney Island Avenue or near Newkirk. Um, and this is this is sort of to to the point about allowing for modest levels of growth that fits you know generally within the context. Um, and then parts of Flatbush Avenue, uh, Newkirk, we actually applied the um, voluntary inclusionary housing program where we do allow buildings to be an extra floor uh, and a slightly higher FAR in exchange for providing 20% um, of the units be affordable. And Jonah, just to step in real quick, uh, how did these uh, decisions get made in terms of the uh, specifics of the zones and uh, you know some of the requirements? Uh, what, what was the process through through ULERP to to effectuate these uh, you know these zoning uh, uh, choices? I, I would say it was a. Uh, I would actually defer to some of the board members. They might actually be more familiar than me, um, but I would say it was a process where we. Uh, we proposed it, uh, and it was a conversation dialogue with the community board that requested the the neighborhood wide rezoning. Um, but I guess, uh, in a more nitty gritty sense, it it's uh, a lot of uh, analysis. So we're looking at what are the existing uh, built FARs of of buildings and seeing to what extent. Uh, by mapping R7A, for example, would that induce a lot of uh, development um, and being a little uh, surgical in thinking about, you know, let's say like areas of Coney Island Avenue where we do feel that that type of growth is appropriate looking, you know, macro level at the neighborhood um, versus areas, let's say like on the Northern part of the district where uh, the built FARs are actually in like the three to five range. And so we don't necessarily anticipate a lot of growth there, but the goal is more of a preservation oriented, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And and actually we have one more question regarding the process as well from Glenn Bristow. Uh, can a zoning change be initiated by a non-property owner or someone who does not have a direct interest in the area to be rezoned? It, it can. 
Um, but we do generally require uh, what's called an owner's authorization as part of that. So if we are, um, I don't believe it's a requirement for zoning map changes um, because they, uh, they typically cover more than a single property. Um, but for other applications, like a, um, a special Sorry. permit, uh, we do require the owner to authorize um, that if it if that makes sense. Um, just and, and I would, mm -hmm. If I might yeah. jump in for just a second. Um, when it came to the rezoning and community board 14, uh, that was basically Richard and myself were at the heart of that. So, Carl, if you're really interested in getting into the nitty gritty about how to go about that, what happened, um, that would be a separate phone call uh, because it, it would take some time to explain. But I'm happy to, to go through that with you if, you if you're interested. So, I just want to quickly add two things that when Jonah mentioned about the property owner being part of the rezoning, right? It may or may not be with the developer. There are times that you see additional property owners, I'm sorry, additional properties added to the rezoning because of a logical sense of what is an appropriate minimum area to move forward. And sometimes it's not always a minimum area, but it's, it's a logical area, like going from corner to corner. Like, for example, the Cortelia Road rezoning did have a couple of properties not controlled by the developer. So there would be no certainty of whether those properties would change because there was no interest in moving that. But over time, somebody who falls into a rezoning because what happens by a neighbor led rezoning might take advantage at a later date. And then to Glenn's point about the rezoning in uh, the northern part of the district, the issue was empowering community and as well zoning options so how to stand the it's part of the give and take with communities in terms of understanding what achieves various objectives and then obviously the department that looks at the option and they'll come up with what they believe is a sound initial proposal. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, Rich, uh, just to introduce Richard uh, properly. That's Richard Barrick, uh, Director of Land Use in the Borough President's Office, just for anyone who may be watching. Um, okay, thank, thank you. And Jonah, um, please proceed. We'll, uh, we'll let you uh, okay. continue. Almost finished, uh, just a few more slides. Um, while I'm on the slide, I, I also want to mentioned just a key point about how we think of the appropriate density. Um, when we say corridor, sometimes we're thinking about the, the width of a corridor. So because Cortelu Road is, let's say, wider than a, a, a side street or because Ocean Avenue or Coney Island Avenue are wider, we f often believe that can be an opportunity to have a, a slightly taller uh, building. It's a bit more dense. Um, so that's just sort of Every community is a little different. Every context is different, uh, but we just want to give you a window into uh, some of our thinking around around that as well. And uh, you can go to the next slide. And then this is this is just an example of uh, this is the only R eight uh, level density, which is slightly um, higher than R seven density within community district fourteen. Um, and I just, I just want to show, this is the 1640 Flatbush Avenue project. It's, it's a very small uh, area. It's a private rezoning a couple of years ago across from the Philip Howard apartments, I believe. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, one, one of the reasons why we felt that a slightly higher density made sense here, you know, thinking about all the other parts of, of the district was uh, because how close it is to the Flatbush Junction um, with access to transit, but also amenities and services, and also uh, Flatbush Avenue being on such a wide street. Um, so just to give you a sense of, you know, there, there's sort of this underlying logic that we uh, we like to think of when we're um, thinking about density and height, um, not just looking at, you know, one particular location, but how that kind of sits within the broader uh, neighborhood context. And uh, yep, go to the next slide. 
Um, so coming towards the end, uh, this is just a, a reminder, a reminder that uh, zoning is really just one tool. Uh, the department is engaged in many types of planning activities and we're, we also work with our, our sister, our agency partners on, um, and so while we're focused on kind of uh, zoning and land use, uh, we're also, you know, working with the parks department and Department of Housing and Preservation Development with EDC. Uh, so planning for the city is really a, a collaborative effort that involves an assortment of tools and strategies. And uh, I think many of you know, so I'll just quickly go this, but the, the planning department is, is uh, focused on processing applications for zoning changes, for um, advancing its own proposals. Uh, if a project is meeting the current zoning, um, they just go straight to the, build, the buildings department or DOB, uh, and DOB is responsible for uh, processing those as of right developments or permits, as well as uh, enforcing the zoning. So if there's a violation that we observe, the DOB would be the ones that would go out and send inspectors and issue violations. And then the Board of Standards and Appeals or BSA is is meant for unique situations or uh, hardships of granting variances where the zoning can't be met and an owner has to demonstrate uh, uh, very clear findings why that's the case, as well as um, certain types of special permits. And uh, just as a quick sample of the types of land use actions, many, um, they're often divided into uh, categories of whether they uh, require full public review or ULERP or non-ULERP. Um, so many of the applications that we have are are what are called uh, certifications by the, the chair or the CPC that may not require full ULERP. Like if you're we're reviewing a waterfront public access area or an authorization that's allowing certain height flexibility uh, for the most part, we're reviewing, at least within Brooklyn CD14, we're involved with uh, rezoning changes like the Cortell U Road or Flatbush Avenue projects. Um, and then uh, I know that one of the most active applications within CD14 is the, the R2 area south of Brooklyn College, where the BSA has a, a special permit that allows home enlargements. Um, and so I'm happy to, to talk more about that. I, I don't think BSA would be better touching on that, but um, uh, that's just an example of where the BSA um, serves an important land use function as well, um, where they're, and, but they also have their own uh, standards and practices. Uh, Jonah, just a question that's arisen. Um, talking about variances, uh, you, you may not have uh, full experience on, on what, you know, is, is typically experienced, but uh, generally, are variances pretty pretty rare, or you know, are they granted pretty uh, you know pretty liberally? What what is your sense on on how variances are usually handled um, when they're received? It uh, it really depends on the the type of a variance, and um, it also depends on the um, the chair of the BSA. There's some uh, practices that are, I, I would say. Um, Often variances are grouped into certain types. So uh, there are variances for uh, allowing residential in manufacturing districts. And often the BSA has certain standards for how to uh, review the findings and meet those. Um, uh, if you're in Borough Park, you, you may see some, there's some schools in uh, or larger school buildings in uh, manufacturing district areas. That that's another example of a variance where um, uh, a school being a um, serving like a, a public function nonprofit led uh, asks for variances in height um, or density, and the BSA often has their own standards for that. Uh, I think this is a little outside of our wheelhouse. We, we get referred on. On all the applications, but in my experience, um, there's often this underlying uh, rationale that they use, and they try to apply consistent standards. 
um, even though it's it's really a case by case review. Gotcha. And uh, just when we're talking about the the special permit that we're talking about that you mentioned about seventy three six twenty two, that's different from the special special districts that we mentioned before, correct? That's right. Special districts are live in the zoning. Um, those are just special rules that people, uh, owners or developers have to abide by. Um, the special permit is an actual application, um, if that makes sense. So the special district are just the, the rule, the regulations, uh, while the special permit is requires like a full application process. Gotcha, gotcha. And just looking at this slide, these are the types of applications that the community board, that, these are the ones that are often referred to us, correct? The, the ULERP applications, the special permits, uh, you know, these are the, these are the applications we tend to see, correct? The B, yeah, the BSA is seem, that's the lion, it seems like the lion's share of land use applications in, that the board sees. The, um, while ULERP is a bit more, um, I don't want to say rare, but it, it's not as frequent, uh, maybe like a handful every year at most. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, I just want to plug the, the a tool called Zola. Uh, it's a great platform where you can kind of toggle on and off uh, the layers for zoning districts, as well as uh, uh, many different types of information on um, city council boundaries or community district boundaries. Uh, uh, so I, it's a great tool also to look up buildings. So you can click on buildings and get a link to ACRIS, to DOB. Um, it's a tool that we use every day. And um, so I would just encourage everyone to look at that as well. If you're, if you want to kind of dig more into um, the, the zoning. And uh, yeah, that uh, we can skip this up. I was going to do a quick demo, but can just open it up to questions. All right. Yeah. Th thank you so much, Jonah. Uh, very, very informative. I know we uh, will probably have a few questions for you as well. Uh, just, just to start off, uh, see some hands already. So, uh, my question would be, uh, could you just talk a little bit about uh, the community board's role in this process and where city planning, where city planning sits? Um, you know, where community boards can be most like CB 14 can be most effective in terms of uh, making decisions uh, on applications. For sure. So I would say it's, it's uh, two things, you know, first, uh, as a liaison to the board, you can treat me as kind of a local planner. Uh, and I want to, you're always welcome to contact me and give me comments or ask questions. Um, so that that's just like an open door, uh, and that that's part of our 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 role uh, as planners. And and in a more formal way, whenever an application uh, like a Euler uh, is coming before you, we uh, there is a required sixty day review period for the board. Um, and in the case of certain applications, like an authorization, that's a forty five day review period. Um, but we also, um, for most applications, especially if we know that they're going to be um, contentious, we, we always urge applicants to meet as early as possible with the community board. Um, and I, I can attest to this. I think we, you know, we asked for the Cortelli Road one for, I think, Caden Park Nursing Home. So, um, and for the most part, applicants do that because they, they see the value and importance of that early consultation. Indeed, and uh, Richard, I, I know that we're that you're sort of on the other side of, of the process often with, with the community board. W would you have anything to add to what Jonah's already said in terms of uh, the CB, you know, CB community board's participation in, in the process? Right, so the community board process, first of all, I consider a preamble part of the borough president's process. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to learn what our role and process to solve thing is to be technical support to make sure that they're understanding the area within the process. Uh, 
process. And um, the our president will have happened before the yep. foreign vote. Okay, yeah, Richard, it was a little it was a little choppy there, unfortunately, in your response. Um that's in Greg, this is done yet. Richard, if you just want to minimize your video, that'll help your bandwidth issue if you just close the video. Uh, I don't know why I'm back. Let me try to sign it, sign it back again. We can have me here. Okay, thank you, Richard. While Richard uh, Richard does that, I know Joanne, you have your hand up, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Gregory. <clears throat> Seeing no other hands, I just wanted to ask this question. Um, uh, understanding that um, DCP's role is um, also part of you know this larger uh, process. Um, how does DCP think about the impact of zoning changes on either service delivery or the availability of resources? And what I mean is. Um, as we increase density, um, how does DCP think about police coverage, fire protection, school seats, um, water and sewer, st sewer delivery, things of that nature? So, you know, something as simple as, you know, having the resources for sanitation in an, in a, uh, an area that's growing. That's a great question. Uh, in short, we care deeply about, about all that. Um, uh, I, I guess it, there, there's different components. Uh, so first, uh, one is that for most applications, they do have an environmental review. And so as part of that, there are, sorry, was there? Oh. Uh, so the environmental review does require part of that. Uh, and in many instances, other agencies actually have to respond. Um, and it's it's based on a series of uh, triggers based on the the um, the the size and scope of a development. So uh, if you have you know a certain number of units based on the size of an area or based on the open spaces within an area, then that will require uh, the parks department to weigh in. And additional analysis may show whether there's an impact. Uh, that has to be disclosed or whether that impact can be um, mitigated in a more legal sense. Um, the other aspect is that our agency has a capital planning division and we have a planning coordination division. So we're, we're, we're constantly checking the local uh, district needs statements and the priorities that are set there. And whenever a proposal comes before us, we, we flag for other agencies and um, and for private applicants, if it relates to their project. Um, uh, but when it comes to school seats, we actually have a more uh, discreet role. We are providing information directly to SCA, School Construction Authority, about uh, proposed rezonings that are in the pipeline, and, and that's actually um, baked into their, their five-year capital plan. Um, so we have a more um, close dialogue to ensure that uh, school capacity is being met. Um, and not to, to add more to the question, but when we're doing uh, neighborhood planning and we're, we're promoting, um, uh, a large amount of growth, whether it's housing or commercial, uh, we have a more engaged effort with agencies to support, um, capital improvements and address, uh, needs, whether it's from sanitation to schools, to parks, um, so it, it's it's not a it's not a one size fits all. It really depends on um, the type of application and an effort that we're doing. Thank you, Janet. Can I uh, can I just jump in quickly because there is another question in the chat. I don't know if you saw it, Greg. The about. I did, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do you want to go ahead with it then? Um. Sure. Oh, actually, I, I see the hand raised. But you're you're referencing. Well, I was referring to whether the question of whether uh, historic districts are considered special districts. Not not in zoning uh, special districts. The way we're using it is a um, more strict term for special zoning rules. Okay, we'll leave um, it at that for now, and we can we can expand on it if if uh, Mr. Bristol wants to follow up separately. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, we just had the hand raised, Fred. Uh, Fred Bayer. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. 
there. Hi. Um, it's similar to the question I was going to ask is what's the relationship between historic districts and the work that DCP does on um, on zoning in general? It's a, uh, I would say it's a it's a close relationship in some ways. So historic districts, uh, they're not a Euler application, but they do come before the commission. Uh, to for more of a, a sign off that we, um, but that that's more of a um, landmark thing. thing. But they they are uh, another layer of review, so that they're 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 meant to be um, kind of uh, consistent or um, uh, uh, they're they're just they're meant to they're sort of like MIH in a way that they're they're in conjunction with the zoning. So if you have a uh, like a Victorian home that wants to be built within Dimmis Park, and it's also within an R3X district, you have to meet both the zoning rules, but then you also have to apply to the right. to LPC. Right. Okay. So it's Thank kind you. of like both. Yeah. Also okay. add that zoning is not guaranteed, right? Just because you have zoning rights, the whatever the allowable amount that the Landmarks Commission might sign off on is times less than zoning allows. And the other thing is there are certain situations where one could apply for a special permit to modify the zoning boundaries, but it's first after getting approval from Landmarks, and then it goes to a process with the Community Board and ultimately City Planning Commission and can be called up at a council where you get some stability. So you might have a a parking lot next to a house of worship, and it may allow an opportunity to develop the property a little inconsistent with the zoning. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I, I think with that, then we'll, I think it's time to wrap. We're just beyond our allotted time. Um, so it, thank you very much, Jonah, for, for your time and your presentation today. Richard, thank you as well. For your input, Glenn, for the historic uh, uh, background for the rezoning, uh, and and we hope that uh, moving forward in the uh, in the uh, uh, additional programs that uh, we'll learn just as much as we did today. So thank you all. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here, and feel free to reach out for any questions or thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jonah, Greg, Richard, Sean, Anya. This was really a great you know, jumping off point for this series. Thanks again for being here. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you at the next ones. We've got other great groups coming up, so please continue to join us. Thanks.